and can make sure that your money is being used efficiently. That's why efficiency becomes such an, an, important, an important thing in, in this discussion. The, the reason efficiency is important for a school system is if we're not efficient, we don't have the resources to provide those educational opportunities that we talked about. We have to be efficient. We need to spend your tax dollars in a very responsible way to ensure your children have the, the best opportunities that we can provide for them. To, to make sure that when your children come through our schools here at South Sand and they eventually graduate from our high schools, they're ready to move on to college. They're ready to move on to whatever job they feel they want to pursue. They're ready to move on to the military. Whatever it is that they want to do, they're well prepared. But we can't do that if we don't spend our money in an efficient way. And that's why this discussion is so important. So what happens when we become more efficient? Well, I can tell you that your tax rate, which which is uh, uh, a dollar, it's actually a dollar, a dollar forty. Sorry, dollar forty-five is what it is, but the dollar four on the maintenance operation, which is the operation of the system, the remaining forty-one cents is is used for for paying our bonds, basically pay, paying our mortgages on on, on on our buildings. But that dollar four to operate the school system on a daily basis has been the same since about two thousand six. It's been about ten years or so since the last time that you saw any kind of a tax rate increase. So for the last ten years. Your tax rate has been very much the same. And I wish I could tell you that our revenue from the state has been the same, or has increased in those 10 years. But frankly, the revenue that we have today is actually less than what we had in 2008. So, so the revenue the re revenue part uh, has been very, very tight. So if you don't have new money coming in, you, and you want to do new things and provide more opportunities for children, you need to be able to reallocate that money in, in areas that become more important. I want to share with you some of the some of the things some of the things that have occurred in this district in just the last three three years. Again, no new monies, but basically looking at things a little differently and spending money more, more efficiently. What, one of the most important steps we, we took, we the district, we support the school board was to start the early college program at our, at our high school. We're in the second year of that program. It takes four years to phase it in. So in two more years, it's completely phased in. And two years from now, the graduating class of 2019, about a fourth of that graduating class will not only be receiving a diploma, they'll be receiving an associate's degree from college. They will have two years of college under their belt, tuition free, not, parents, parents have not paid a penny in tuition, but they're halfway through college already. All right, so that becomes real important. Uh, the, the probability of, of those young people finishing college eventually is increased dramatically because they're halfway there as soon as they walk out of walk out of high school. The next thing, the next thing we have listed here, the college and career pathways. There's actually three pathways in the high schools. The very first one is the early college that I talked about, and these two are the next are the, are the other two. The college ready pathway is. Is a, is a pathway that also prepares young people uh, to go to college and ensures that they're able to earn college credit also. They may not go all the way up to the 60 hours that the, the first group, but they can go up to about 42 hours. That's, a, that's about a year and a half of college that they will also complete, ready to move on, also to tuition free. The other pathway, which is the career <laughs> pathway, ensures that young people that, you know, may, they may not have an interest at this point to move on to a four-year college, but they may have an interest to have a good job when they come out of high school. Well, this will allow them an opportunity uh, in the career technology area to, to come up with a job certification, be trained to do something in, 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 in jobs and make sure that they're able to leave high school and, and, and have a good job and not just go to a minimum wage job. So th those are the opportunities that we have right now with our, with, with our high school. We've also had enhanced technology at the high school and at the at the middle schools. We've been pretty far behind in the school system in the area of technology. Um, yeah, yes, our schools have only had a few computers, but they really have not had the level of technology that other school districts provide their their their, their students. We're trying to rectify that. Uh, we initiated a an iPad program two years ago in conjunction with the uh, with the early college. Uh, program and the, uh, the, uh, the other pathways. And so we're facing in over a period of four years iPads or, or PCs, uh, laptop computers, 
intro our high school. So again, in two years, that should be fully implemented. Uh, this past this year, actually, we started uh, the implementation of, of, of laptops, cold loads, if you would, at the middle school. But we still haven't gotten to the elementary. We still need to get to the elementary. We have, we, we're not quite there yet, but we need to be able to do that. Uh, we've also, excuse me, we've also have extended, have extended the after school program that become really important, I know, for, for working parents uh, into the into the pre-K four-year-old programs. We, we did have that until three years ago. Uh, not many students have participated in it, but, but it's available for parents that need that type of support. Uh, we've also improved the, the infrastructure, our buildings. Now, one, of the, one of the things that that I'll tell you about, I'll tell you about our school system. Our school district has not in the past invested enough money for our facilities. Uh, we have a, a few new schools, but the high school is brand new, it's a great facility. Uh, we have a new middle school that's within 10 years or so, so I'm one of a middle school. And we have probably two elementaries, Campillo and Monte Benavides, that are relatively new. The rest of our schools are pretty old. The schools in this area, Shepherd's pretty old, Armstrong's pretty old, White Ponds, and so forth, Mountain, and so forth. All of these schools need improvement. We started to improve these schools. But it's going to take even more investment into, into those schools. We need to be able to, to do better. But, but we have started for that. The same thing with upgrading equipment, for this air conditioners, whatever it may be, we're trying to upgrade that. Uh, we'll move on to the expansion of adult programs. Some of you might, might participate in our, our adult programs that we have. Uh, we have classes here, here at the administration building uh, next door uh, for adults. We also have classes at the white campus. So previously we only had one location, now we have two. And we would, we would love to have the third one in the Palo Alto area, we're just not there, so there yet. Uh, with, the, with the improvement and management of the system, we're able to attract uh, the attention of, of the, whether it be the federal government, sometimes the state government. When they see a school system that, that has a future, being, being well managed, they, they invest money in the system. We were able last year, actually two years ago, to, I'm sorry, to, to land a $3.6 million grant in PDIS, which is the Positive Behavior Interventions and Support. It's basically working with young people on how to behave, you know? And I know, if, you know, many people feel, well, my, my child knows how to behave, it's the others. I understand that. But if maybe the others, it's everyone that we need to be working with. And it seems to be working. You know, the feedback we're getting from our teachers seems to indicate that in, in most cases it's working pretty well. The other thing, the other indication that we have is that the referral to our alternative school, where, where young people really misbehave and they have to be referred out to a special school, and we do have that special school, uh, uh, that the referrals have dropped dramatically. And, and so we, we serve very few uh, young people there because schools, teachers, and principals are dealing with, with, with those behaviors. And the other thing that becomes important, if we're going to keep good employees, good teachers, and we have great teachers, we have great employees, we have to pay them. And so we've been able to give them a pay raise each of the last the last three years. And so all of that has occurred in the last three years, and, and it's, it's occurred without a tax rate in, in, on your part. We've not raised your taxes. Basically, we have done we have done this with the, the, uh, the revenues that we've had by doing some things differently, looking at how we invest our money. And, and, and really, that's what efficiency is about. So what can happen with better efficiency and the redirection of more resources? Well, one of the things that can happen, just last, just last week we had a board meeting, and uh, we reported to the board that we would like to, to um, enhance the uh, of the health science program that we have in the high school. We opened a new high school about three years ago with, at the same time, launched a health, health science academy. And I'll be honest with you, I don't feel this, we as a school system did enough to, to support that program. It needs to be better supported. We intend to be able to, to, to do that. We intend to really beef up that program, provide the support that those teachers and the people that work in, those pro in that program need to make sure that this becomes a real, a real important program for young people. I want your children to have choices. If they want to go into, into a health science, they ought to have a quality program to go into. And, and we, want to, we want to work in improve, improving that. I mentioned earlier, we, we need to improve the, uh, in, uh, technology at the elementary. We're not there yet. We need to move forward with that. 
the middle schools. We have four middle schools right now, and we have electives in our schools, but we have very few, very few electives for your children to, to select from. If you have children in the middle school, there's just a couple of electives that, that they have choices on. The primary reason that we don't have a lot of a lot of electives in our middle schools is we have middle schools that have low enrollment. When you don't have a lot of students in, in, in a school and the enrollment numbers are, are low, you're not able to offer many choices. And so we want to be able to, to, to do that. So we, we, we want to work in, in, in that direction. We also want to convert our middle schools into magnet schools. Magnet schools are what we call specialty schools. Schools that, that specialize. For example, if your child, for, for whatever reason, really enjoys fine arts, we want to have a fine art middle school. And I don't care where you live, even if, if you don't know, live close to a fine art school, we want your child to go to that fine art school if, that, if that's really their interest. If your child's interest is technology, or maybe uh, engineering or STEM, we want your child to attend that type of school. And so we want to be able to convert our middle schools to, to, to specialties so that students, when they enroll, they enroll based on, on that specialty and not necessarily based on where, where, they, where they live. <clears throat> And then we want to continue with the with the investment on, in, our, in our infrastructure. Like I said, our facilities are, are very dated. They need to be improved. Uh, we need to invest in, in this facility um, because over a period of time, we've not done that sufficiently. We've done some, but we've not done enough of that. We also want to continue the opportunities for young people in the summer. Uh, we, we actually have started that already, uh, and, and to offer more programs, more opportunities in the summer. Uh, we want young people to stay actively engaged in, in, the, in learning experiences in the summer. And uh, little by little, we have we have more students uh, participating in these programs. We want to give them more opportunities. Sorry, your mic. Oh, I'm sorry. Maybe I just maybe I just talked about. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, so, so we, we want to we want to continue to to enhance the opportunities for our young people in the summer. And the last thing we have is to there is invest more in our teachers. We want we have great teachers, but we want to give them more opportunity to to do more training, to become better teachers, to to, to, to attend the type of programs in the summer that, that they want to attend. So we want to invest more in our, in our, in our teachers. So let me tell you a little bit about our enrollment trends. Now, what, I, what I'm going to talk about now is, is information that we attended the first series of meetings in February. Some of this is a little bit of a repeat, but I see as I look around, a lot of people were not here in February, so this will be new information for you. The very first fact I'll share with you is that in the last three years, our district enrollment has actually decreased by 325 students. We've dropped, our enrollment has dropped by 325 students, which is a drop of about almost three and a half percent. The projection for next year, for this coming school year in, in August, is that we will drop an additional 469 students. We have two charter schools by the same charter uh, being opened in, brand new being opened in our district. There's one right next door to it, next door to the school, which is the idea school, and there's one over there by, by Hutchins in the Palo Alto area that's being opened also. We have received information from them. We've done open records requests from, the, from those schools to find out how many children that reside within South Sand have enrolled there. And, and we have that information. It's the number they gave us about 358. And, and so we know at this point, or a few weeks ago, that was the number at that time. I expect it to continue to grow. All right, so that would be a decrease at that point of about a little over 8%, 8.15%. A year later, a year later, because these two these two charter schools will not be full next year. They're, I believe they're taking in four grades, if I recall correctly, maybe three. But what they're going to have left the following year is the remaining grades. If they attempt to fill that school at that time with the remaining grades, I anticipate that will be a, a drop of another 400 students. So in a, in a period in a period of about five years. We've dropped about 12 percent if all that happens, you know, and it seems like that seems to be the trend. That, that, it seems to be that that's, that's where we're headed. So then I want to share with you, if we're dropping, what does that mean in reference to, to classroom space? 
in this, our schools. All right, and I'm going to show you that. This year we have, this year, keeping in mind that up to this point we've lost 342 students. The very first fact that I gave you. With with that drop alone, and we have 732 32 students. Uh, our enrollment right now is 9,638 at the snapshot date back in October, which means that we are utilizing now this year we, we utilize about 59 percent of our capacity. About 41 percent of our capacity is either not being used or is not being used sufficiently. Meaning <coughs> the rooms could be empty and some are empty, or we have very small classrooms, uh, uh, very, uh, small enrollments in, in classrooms, or they're being used for weight rooms, or they're being used for uh, offices, or they're being used for different things. But as far, but they're designed for classrooms. And so the efficiency of, of how we use our buildings is not, it's not very high, 59%. With the projection for next year, if the previous projections pan out, we anticipate that the efficiency will drop by another 3%, to so about 56%. And then when we go to uh, uh, four years from now, uh, again, if the trend continues, we expect that our efficiency drops about 50%. That literally means that about half of our space, half of our classroom, are not being used for what they're intended to be used for, or they're simply not efficient. You know as well as I do, that if whatever the size of your family is, let's just say whatever size of the family is, that if you need a two-bedroom house or a two-bedroom apartment, you go buy or rent a two-bedroom house or apartment. You don't go buy a five-bedroom house because that costs money to operate and, and those rooms will be empty. So that's just, this is what we're facing. We don't need that much space, but we have it already, okay? So that we have the space and we need to be able to do something about it or we're investing money in these empty classrooms, as opposed to investing money in those other uh, other opportunities that I talked about earlier, to give our students better better opportunities. So these are these are the choices that we have. We have, we, we have to do something, and there are some choices. And I'm going to present four options. And there could be more options uh, available, but for right now, I'm presenting four options. Uh, that I'm going to present to the Board of Trustees for them to consider. I am going to give them a recommendation concerning one of these, these options, but I want, to share, I want to share with you what those options are, and then I want to share with you what the consequences of those options are as well. So option one would be to consolidate the enrollment at Athens Elementary School with the students at Rio and Price, which would result in the closing of Athens. We've done our studies. We know that there's enough space at, at Price and, and, and Carrillo to accommodate the students. There is space available in, in those schools, and we know that, that, that that's possible. We also, we also are considering, as part of option one, to consolidate the students from Cason, the enrollment in Cason Middle School, which is in the Palo Alto area, which is real close to San Juan Middle School, familiar with, with the area, and move that enrollment at Cason split it between Samoa and Dwight. We have plenty of space in those two schools to accommodate the students. As a matter of fact, if we do this, we would still have empty rooms in those two middle schools, at least one of those two middle schools, if we did this. We would not, even like that, we don't utilize all the false classrooms. Um, and then the last thing we would do is recommend also, within option one, that we would close the alternative school, which is a small school that we have to serve physical problems. Whenever students seriously misbehave, they get removed and so forth. And and one of the things that, that has occurred as a result of the PBIS, we don't have a lot of referrals this year into the alternative school. On on average, on average, we're serving about 15 students a day in that school. Since the beginning of the year to this time, we're on average serving about 15 students a day. Well. That's the average. We have a few more right now. We have like 25 right now. But ordinarily, the average is about 15. We have nine teachers there. Nine teachers. We have a principal there. We have a counselor there. We have custodial help. We have cafeteria help. So we're basically spending about three quarters of a billion dollars, to give you an idea, in operating that facility to serve an average of about 15 students. And so we need to do something different. That's not a wise, 
wise investment of money, we need to be able to serve the students uh, uh, differently. If we were to close that school, we would try to partner with a neighboring district that, that has a larger program and basically contract with them and partner with them so that they would serve those students. And we would pay that district to do that, but we would pay whatever the reasonable cost is, the fair, the fair cost is, to serve whatever number of students that, that we send them. And we think that that's, that's possible. So that's option one. Then we go to option two. Option two is very similar to option one, but the one thing that would be different would be that instead of closing Kaysen this coming year, we would delay it by one year, delay the closing by one year, and see if that community, that school, could build their enrollment up to where the numbers increase, and so that we're not, we don't, we don't have to close it. So that's that's one option. The next option is option three, very similar, the same as option one, but this time we would not we would not close Athens for at least one year to see if that community could build up enrollment and see if, if that would make a difference. And then, of course, we have option four, which would be the status quo. Continue to do what we've been doing and continue to remain inefficient. The inefficiency continues, you know? And we continue with empty classes and so forth. That, that, in my opinion, is not a good option. But nevertheless, it's an option that, that, that is available. So those are the four options that I intend to present to the board for them to consider. They may have other ideas. They may receive other ideas from other folks as well. That they can consider whatever they want to consider when they make their decision, which will be on, on April the 19th. Thank you. So let me share with you the consequences. If we were to do option one, if we were to do option one, uh, if we close Athens, now keep in mind that, that, you know, when you close a school, you still have the students that are in that school. And they move on to other schools, so teachers basically follow those students. And, and so you still have teachers to, 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 to employ. But you don't have an extra principal, secretary, assistant principal, counselor, librarian, whatever it may be. So there's, there is some savings there. In the case of Athens, we've, we've estimated that we would, we would say pick up $0.6 million, $600,000. If we were to close Kaysen, we think that that savings would be closer to $2 million. Because not only do you have the front office space, the support staff and so forth, and clerical and, and custodial and so forth, uh, but you would also you know, would also have the savings in, in in staffing more efficiently. When you have bigger middle schools, you don't need as many teachers, and so there, there's going to be fewer teachers required. And so we would pick up, we think, about two million dollars, and then you have the closing of the alternative. As I said earlier, we're running it at about three quarters of a million. We think we would save at least half a million. We've, we've left a quarter of a million aside for the contract, which, which whatever district we, we try to contract with, to be able to pay pay, pay that contract. So, so option one basically would provide about three point one million dollars for new education opportunities for for young people. Again. That basically the same money, but you're looking at spending the money differently and provide students more, more opportunities. Option two, that would keep at, excuse me, case, case and open, would would generate about about 1.1 million dollars uh, that, that can be redirected for new opportunities for, for students. Option three, that would keep Athens open would generate about two and a half million dollars for redirecting to, for new opportunities for, for, for students. And then of course option four really does not provide any new money because we continue to do this, the same thing. So that's basically where we are. Now, as, as superintendent, my job is to make a recommendation to the board. I have to decide this. It's not my final decision, but it is my it is my job to study this carefully and make a recommendation to the board. So my recommendation to the board will be on April the 19th, option one, that would result in the closure of Athens with the consolidation with Camille and Price, the closure of Kazan with consolidation with someone and White, and the closing of the Alternative Center. I feel that makes this district more efficient. Uh, as a school system, we should always be looking at the efficiency of, of the operation. 
again, it's your tax dollars, but more importantly, it's how we serve our students. What are the education opportunities that, that, we, that we provide our students? That becomes real, real important. So with that, I'm going to stop talking, and I'm going to give the, the community, any of you that have been, come to the mic, and um, the, uh, the, the rule for tonight is every, you can come to the mic, everyone's going to be exercise common courtesy and respect for each other, and the limited students. So we'll start with you.
you were voted in, and you were voted in to be our voice. And we have stressed clearly that we do not want any campuses closed. I also ask you, board president, and the rest of the board members, and everybody take a look around and look for your board member, to look for other avenues. Uh, Mr. Superintendent, the community has not been involved. You said that you had six meetings. When you step back and look at it, in all reality, it's two meetings per area. That is two meetings to tell us that our schools will be closed. Let's remember what they did when they closed West Campus. They killed our community. There was already trouble starting because of the rumors of school closures with children. I'm asking you, Superintendent, to involve this community. How many contracts do we have with air conditioning places? How many people do we pay for our air conditioning? How many contracts are there? That's money saved right there. We keep bringing in however many for air conditions that have been had to have been replaced over and over and over again. You know, you're, you're throwing at us that these schools need to be closed for cost, you know, because of the cost. You, we're housing administration. It has a whole gym at the bottom, a full-size gym that's being air-conditioned all day long. You want to move the the uh, the alternative school? Why not? And it's costing all this money. You're saying why not move you guys to the alternative school and open this up for our children so that it is sufficient, so that it is being for our children. So that we have many places where we can save money. And you're talking about all these programs. Well, we do have that open space according to you. Not, why not use that open space to start these programs instead of shutting down our schools? And to hold these meetings right before the STAR test start is beyond ridiculous. Because not only are the children stressing, the teachers are stressing, and everybody in this community is stressing. And to go to, when the board has not even voted yet, to go to a campus and tell the teachers the where they're going already and how they will be packed and how we will supply the boxes to them, that's not appropriate. This board has not voted. I encourage all of you board members to listen to your community. Do not let their vote our school. Anybody else that would like to come to the mic? Mr. Clark. Hi, I'm Paul Burns, uh, president of the Valley Forest Neighborhood Association. Our area starts across the street from here and goes up to the Bingham Base Road. As you can see, every day they're building right across the street. And the area there is supposed to go up to about 150 houses from about 30. So this is an area that is growth. Other area around Valley Cars, we're now negotiating and they're painting another 150 houses there. Also across the street is a new shopping center that they've just started to build. So this is an area that, with extreme growth. Uh, city councilman says, boy, this place is really going to be growing all around here. So it was with the Sign of relief that I saw there's nothing here that's on the shopping cart for right now. And I think they were very wise to consider problems going on. So thank you. Yes, sir. We, we did take that into consideration. This is actually the only area in the district that has room for growth. And like you stated, there's no school scheduled for growth at this time in this area. Somebody else would like to take the mic. Cummings. Thank you. My name is Tom Cummings and I'm representing the South San AFT, which is the teachers' union. And tonight we're asking again that the recommendation of the school board include a tax reauthorization election, or TRE. We've already begun to see the destructive effect, the closing just talking about the closing of the school will have in South Sand. It will be the first step if it's done in the dismantling of the district over time. That is our view. A TRE could be on the November election ballot. There's time for that. 
And if successful, would add an estimated $7 million to the budget or a 7 to 8% increase in the district's budget. This would allow the community and the district to develop the programs necessary to keep our students, schools open, neighborhoods with their identities, and recruit students who have left Southside back to the classroom of Southside. If successful, there, there's been a question about whether the money would come in town. If successful, the district's fund balance would be used as a loan bank for the money that will be coming in. So then you split the money over a two-year process and you have three and a half million plus three and a half million. You should be enough to begin programs. Over the years, South San AFT has spoken over, over 10 years. Uh, we've urged superintendents to develop programs such as magnet schools, specialized schools, et cetera, and to fund them through the TRE. And that's over five superintendents we've spoken to about that. Except for the early high, college high schools have been no avail so far. We've had the, the conversations that have started. Uh, but South Sand is reaching a moment where there may be no return. That's not guaranteed. It's not, we're not that fatalistic, but it is a challenge. Uh, and we could very easily get into a spiral of uh, losing more and more students, which only causes more students to be lost. Uh, so we would urge you not to close schools in this coming school year, uh, but to see what other options are there and to go for the TRA and continue to develop South Stand and to grow it. Thank you.
those, those they're not being broken. No, the question is, the kids are watching porn. No, ma'am, not, not on our, they can't get through the, the, the firewall that we have. They're doing it, they're not doing it, they're not doing it at school. How come you don't cut your pay to make a better school? I could cut my pay to one dollar and it wouldn't be sufficient to, to do that. Uh, comment, you are hurting children, if you are a parent, you should know how we feel. I heard that, that a decision has been already made, I think, that you should consider a bond. Uh, Comment, you have closed schools in Houston. I have, and that when I, when I was superintendent there. I have observed your face and seen that you don't care. You're just wasting our time. Please consider not closing our schools. Okay. So that's Rachel, Rachel and the comments. Before I ask board members if they have comments, is there anybody else from the, from the community that would like to take the mic and make any remarks or ask any questions? Yes, ma'am. I don't want to speak much in public, but um, they are using the iPods for, like she said, porns and stuff because my niece is a junior. That's what I was saying. And they gave them all to the freshman, right? Freshman. Just your freshman. Right. And my niece saw some of them broke outside in the lunchroom. She's in um, the Honor Society. And she's like, why don't you give them to the people that's going to, like, you know, accept them. You know, instead of half of the people that get them, they're throwing them away. They're breaking them. And two, for the transportation, how do you plan on getting all the kids to school if they don't have, like, their parent can't give them up? I take my kids and drop them off. But, like, my niece rides the bus. And she is late a lot because of... Her bus has to have other kids, and her bus is late because of it. So how do you plan on getting all these kids to school on time because of you want them to close certain schools? Let me just answer your question on the buses. Uh, the, the school district, like all other school districts, ordinarily provide transportation for, for families that, for children that live two, two miles or more, or, or have hazardous conditions. Right. So, so by state rules, we can identify up to ten percent of our routes as hazardous. So, if 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 any of the schools are closed and it requires more transportation, we'll look at it. We'll you know we'll follow the same rules we, 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 we've always followed and, and provide transportation if, if it's uh, necessary to do that. But if you're having to close schools in one area, that means the kids are not going to live as close to their schools. So, of course, they're going to need transportation. Right? Well, that's one thing that's not real clear is that, for example, in the case in the case of uh, uh, the elementary school, Athens, we actually have, we have three schools in very close proximity, which is Athens, Carrillo, and Price. Uh, yes, the distance is a, is a little further, uh, but it's it's probably not far enough to even warrant uh, transportation. But we will we'll look at it. The same thing is true when we start looking at actually some kids that are now attending Kaysen will actually be closer to their school now wide than they than they are to Kaysen right now. So they would be able to follow? In some cases, yes, yes. Just de depends on the proximity of where people live. But, but I know like where my niece is, like they live in an apartment complex. In the first month of school, she was late by 45 minutes. And it put her in so much pressure that she couldn't concentrate when she got there, you know what I mean? And then I'm like, it's still going on through the school year. My sister's like, because my sister, even though she's in high school, she walked to the bus stop and she's like, Nicole, the bus was 45 minutes late. Instead of getting there at 7.15, it would get there at 8 o'clock and they stand out there all this time. Like, in some mornings it's super cold outside. Like, I don't, I don't believe it's not a good choice to close schools for certain reasons, but that's one of them. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else in the community that would like to address this one? Um, my name is Rose Garcia, and my question to you is that you are doing a statistical analysis um, on numbers of uh, students 
and those students are going to be just a guessing. They're just a guessing. Um, the ideal schools are going to have, you know, students registered. I'm telling the community right now with IDEA, what they do is they um, get applications and they're not confirmed. They're not really registered until the beginning of August for state regulations. With that said, there's a lot of students from all over San Antonio. You do not have to live in the boundaries to get those. There are caps at IDEA schools. So my question to you is, what if we do close the schools? What if we close, do close the schools? What's going to happen if you are found with the same students that were not accepted? Are they go through the caps? And, and now you're left with overcrowding of your schools. Um, another thing, um, I just want to let you know I'm pleased to your board members, your community, to do the right thing before you are um, held up with overcrowding. And my daughter did attend the middle school at Zamora, and I did have a lot of my students that when I previously worked for South Sam, um, I had a lot of them didn't eat lunch already. And it's very disappointing because of really what happened in the past with West Campus. So, excuse me, I'm sorry. So what's gonna happen if um, you are left with that? Overcrowding because this is just the estimate. So we do this just um, statistical analysis again for the reasoning of them not being accepted to IDEA because we know that they cannot register until August because they are not guaranteed a spot. What happens then? Let me let me ask you a question. Yes. First of all, you're you're absolutely correct. Okay. These are projections. Project, projections are, are estimates as you stated. But I can also tell you that if we don't lose one if we don't lose one additional child, not one more, we have exactly the same enrollment that we had this year. Exactly the same enrollment. And we close the schools that, that are being recommended. We would still have space to put all the children in those empty classrooms that we have. And we will still have empty classrooms at that point. That we are so, so, so under-enrolled, 41% under-enrolled, that there's more than enough space to accommodate the children that we have. We could still grow and still accommodate the students based on the space that we have. And then what happens after that? We lose more kids. We lose more parents. We lose more teachers. Everybody that has worked for us has been sticking it out. I was one of the employees that are no longer here, unfortunately, but other employees sticked out for you. We're going to lose teachers to idea. We're going to lose faculty to idea. And then, then what? More closures. More closures and more closures. Thank you. Anybody else that would like to have the mic? Since I didn't get to ask all my questions, I'd like to take another three minutes and finish. I'll be quick. I want you to take three minutes. Okay. All right. When I was on the board, the maintenance costs were astronomical. Way more than should have been going on. I would agree with you. For the number of maintenance people we have, we had way too many of them who were apparently sitting around a lot doing their thumbs. And what is the point of constantly refurbishing and fixing antiquated HVAC systems that are all of them more than 20 years old? It's just absurd. It would be cheaper to replace them, even if you have to do it one school at a time, and you lose all that maintenance cost if we absorbed into the cost of the new system, then it would work better, and you might keep more students. My next door neighbor has two adorable little girls who do not attend South Sand because of all this mess going on. Now you're gonna now you're gonna close more schools, you're gonna lose even more kids who do live here because of that fact. <coughs> exactly, no stability, no sense of community, and that's that's part of why my husband and I, when he retired from the Air Force, that's why we moved back here. Because this was home to us. Our kids also graduated from West Campus, as did my husband and I and my brother. We were the first graduating class out of West Campus. And we saw how well that went. Sure. Ron Durbin did what he wanted to do. He wanted a five-day school at South Sam, so we closed West Campus. And now look where that got us. It decimated this area. And now you want to do the same thing to three more areas? And what do you think that's going to accomplish in the long run? This, is, I think this all falls under the heading of cutting your nose off to spite your face. No. You guys need to look at it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me ask the board members who would like to speak. Ms. 
Brody, would you like to speak? Uh, I'd like to hear from Associate Dean first. She will close Susan. the meeting then. Well, since I first yesterday. No, ma'am. She will close the meeting. She is the president of the board. The president of the board always closes the meeting. It's not Thank a board you. meeting. It's not a board meeting. It is a board meeting. It's no, sir. It's not. It's not. It's, not. We have, it's, a, it's a posted meeting. It's a community. Anyway, go ahead and run it. We don't matter. So the, the meetings, the reason we've been having the meetings, they're supposed to be for the community so we can hear from you. thinking about the recommendation. Uh, the only reason that it has to have an opening and closing is because there's four board members here. That is the only reason. This is not a board meeting. This is supposed to be meetings to hear from the community. Not three minutes, but to give you time to ask questions and give responses. And to say that you're giving them three minutes to include a question and then an answer, that takes away half of their time. So they're not getting any responses. But I, I have been attending every single meeting, every single meeting that they've had. And uh, I can tell you that to close schools is just a travesty to this district. We are closing schools. We are being reactive because we have charter schools that are opening up in our district. There are other campuses, other districts in San Antonio that are faced with the same thing that we're faced. Hardingdale ISD. They opened a charter school right next to their uh, central office, and they, that was an issue that they had to deal with. They've lost schools and uh, students, and they've lost a lot of students. But Harvardale didn't just go out there and say, okay, we're going to have to close schools because we're losing students. They, they took that bullet and they did it, and they said, you know what, we're going to compete. So they passed a bond, $69 million bond. They took their two oldest schools, which is what Athens is one of them in Kaysen, and they went ahead and rebuilt new schools. Because that's what attracts kids to charter schools. They have brand new shiny facilities and they have small class sizes. And that's what we have, that's why we're successful. We have small class sizes. We don't have the 22 to 1 at the elementary, our average is 18.8. .8. And I think Dr. Sawyer, you confirmed that at the meeting yesterday. That's the average of the K to 4 students. But that's why they're able to succeed. And our teachers are, can deal with that. They're not overwhelmed. When you start increasing class sizes, then it becomes overwhelming for the teachers. So we want our kids to succeed. We want our district to succeed. We saw what happened with this campus. Ms. Tomlinson, as she said, was on the school board. I was on the board with her. And at that time, they closed the uh, West Campus at a 5-2 vote. Because Ms. Tomlinson and I fought to keep that school open, and they did not. They promised the community they would keep it open, and then they still closed it. So, and then they built a beautiful administration building, as you can see. Even though it's all at the gym down on the first floor, uh, but I agree that's something that we can use and make into a, a specialized technology STEM uh, showcase a school, so that we can attract those kids that are at the charter schools here and bring them over. The alternative school that I think they're going to contract. I think that facility is probably big enough for the administrative staff that we have. A lot of the staff members that are housed there spend their time at the campuses. The reading specialists, the math specialists, they're out of the campuses. So the people that are there are the administrators. And believe me, if you've not come to the West Campus building, there were so many empty rooms in that building. It was depressing. If you walk there, there's, there's, there's just empty space. So you talk about empty spaces at schools. Central office has a lot of empty space. So if you want to be efficient, that's where you start, at central office. <laughs> As you saw, they're not, there's not going to be any school closures here in the Valley High area. But I can tell you a year ago, this was brought to the board for consideration, and that was to close Athens, Kazan, and Five Palms. Five Palms was being considered for closure. It got off of the chopping block. They decided they weren't going to close Five Palms, so now they're looking at only Kazan and Athens. And Mr. Hurst is right. When you close schools like they did with campus, it stops everything as far as development. They should have had all of their property developed already with the high school open. When they closed it, everything stopped. It's coming back around, 
But when you close schools, whether it's here or on the other side of the district, they know that a district is closing schools, and that is bad. A developer is not going to want to develop more homes. It doesn't matter where if a district is closing schools. They want a school that's thriving, that's building new schools, new facilities, and has more programs to offer. They're going to recommend people to come and live in this district. And I beg you to differ with you, Dr. Sweat. I know you said this is the only area for development. There is room for development down in the old part of South Sand. There is still some room there. Case in point, right in front of the high school. That uh, Baptist University Church, it's being vacated. They're shutting it down. That's land that we should be purchasing, that we should take advantage of, and we're not. So there is room for development and room, not as much as up here, I'll admit, but there is room. So going back to the closure of five palms. They're not going to close five palms, but what they are doing and has not been said is they're going, the district is going to start a new model, and it's called a bilingual cluster model. And what they're doing is they're going to uh, use a model that is being utilized at Northside and uh, Northeast. And I passed out a little slip of paper because I, I was curious to see what Northside did with their bilingual program. I understand they're very successful. But if you can see in your comparison, we are not Northside. I mean, their numbers are just uh, <coughs> blows us out of the water. And I'm sorry. I have a picture. And as you can see, uh, Northside has 104,000 kids, uh, more or less, give or take. Our campus has 9,849, our district, total. They have uh, bilingual students out of Northside, they have 8,043 for a percent of 7.7% of the total student population. South Sand has 1,446 bilingual kids. And that comes out to 14.7% 14 of our total population. We have a large number of bilingual kids in our district. Bilingual teachers, Northside has 119, and we have 83. So considering the, the percentages, uh, we have a lot of bilingual students uh, for the 1,446 kids. Standalone elementaries, and let me tell you what I mean by that. With the cluster, you're going to have a uh, standalone. That means some campuses are not going to cluster with the other schools. They're just going to stay the way they are. The kids are not going to be moved. They'll still be housed out of that campus. We have one. Hutchins Elementary is not going to be moving. Those kids will stay intact. Those bilingual kids will still stay there. The north side has 13 standalone campuses. Cluster Elementary schools, the north side has 19. We have three. And what I mean by three is there's three clusters. The clusters in the old part of South Sand is Athens, Price, and Cabello. Price is going to be the bilingual campus where the other campuses are going to be sending their bilingual kids to. Over here in the Palo Alto area, it's going to be Benavides. Benavides is going to house the kids from Palo Alto and from Kindred. So those bilingual kids will be going over there. Up here in Valley High, Five Palms will be taking all of the bilingual kids from Armstrong and Manila. They'll be moved over to Five Palms Elementary. So they have uh, cluster feeder schools. Northside has 46 cluster feeder schools. They have a lot of campuses. We only have six. So when you start moving all the kids into campuses, then you have to make sure you have enough room for everybody. So that, that's the question. Will Five Palms have enough room to house all of the bilingual students plus the general population. So I, I checked it out to see, and I do have some numbers for five pounds. Please, please bear with me. Uh, first of all, Five Palms has, as of today, and that's based on the uh, statistics that we have been given throughout the months, and the last ones I got were in February, Five Palms has seven bilingual sections. That means they have seven classrooms with bilingual kids. If this, if this change happens today, 
So that means that Armstrong has six sections of bilingual kids. So there's six classrooms at Armstrong. So those will be moved to five pounds. And then, of course, Madla. Madla has nine sections. They have nine classrooms of bilingual kids. So if we told those out, that means that five pounds is going to have 22 sections or 22 uh, classrooms of bilingual students. How many classrooms do five pumps have? They have 22 classrooms. So what's going to happen? They're going to have all the classrooms are going to be bilingual. So my next question is, if all the classrooms are going to be bilingual students, what's going to happen to your computer lab, your science lab, your art room, your music room? Where are these kids going to fit? And what happens to the general population? Does that mean that those kids that are not bilingual, are they going to have to move them then to Armstrong and Madela so they can accommodate the bilingual kids? It's, there's going to be a lot of shuffling going around. So as it is right now, with just the impetus of maybe closing schools, the community is, is not happy. You know, you're already looking at closing schools, and now you're going to start shuffling the bilingual kids. The teachers don't know where they're going. They just know that the campus is closed as they're going to move. They don't know if they're going to go to, let's say, Athens, if they're going to go to Price. They don't know if they're going to have to come up here because of the large number of bilingual kids. There's a lot of uncertainty among the staff, among the students, and the parents. If my child is being moved, how am I going to get them to school? The transportation. And I know uh, someone may come, oh, I think Dr. Sedona said, oh, uh, someone asked, Oh, uh, the lady over there said, well, if they have to move from Canyon to Dwight, they can walk. There's no way those children are going to walk from Gillette all the way to South Cross near Sazamore. That, that's just, that's not going to happen. Those kids will have to be bus. And a lot of our parents don't have transportation. They walk their kids to school. So yes, the transportation cost is going to go up. The same in Samora Middle School. The kids going from Keza to Samora, they're going to end up crossing Highway 90. That is dangerous for those kids. We had a parent last night that said, I don't drive. My child walks to school. Am I going to have to worry every day that he walks to school, that he's going to get run over, something's going to happen? So there's a lot of concerns here. And, you know, the games closing schools, because once you close a school, like you said, Ms. Thompson, you take the heart of the community. Now, the community dies. There's no more development. And for the Athens population, and I have not mentioned it, and I think Dr. Savetha has forgotten, that community is trying to redevelop the old South Sand corridor on South Cross. There's a lot of businesses there that are no longer in operative, but the, the former graduates are coming back, and they're trying to rebuild those businesses to flourish that community. What is it going to do when you close Athens? All of their efforts to try and raise money and rebuild those businesses is going to die. So we're not helping any by closing schools. What we should be doing is competing, competing with idea, and saying, no, we're not going to let you take our kids, because all you're doing is handing the kids to idea. They were, I feel that in Athens Elementary, they have this beautiful dance with pictures of kids across it, and I did a charter school. They had their van parked in front of Athens. They set up a blue table, and they wait for those parents to come out to sign them up. And they don't just go to schools. They go to parks. They offer parents, hey, you have kids, you know, go well, take care of them. They're going to close your school. Don't worry about it. Why don't you have a party? Invite your neighbors. We'll pay for it. Just bring their kids and the families, and we'll get them, and we'll take care of them. We don't want to hand our kids to the charter schools. We want to keep our kids here. We need our schools. And I know it takes money. And I know that the budget is closed. We don't have a lot of money. We're not getting any more state revenue, and I understand that. But there's other ways, and it's not being offered. And it's like Mr. Tom Cummins just said. You can generate by passing a bond. It's going to cost 13 cents. But gosh, we haven't had a tax increase since 2006. And I think if the community knows that it's going to our schools and to our kids and we're not going to close schools, I think everyone will support that if they know that's where it's going. But we have to work as a team. 
it's got to be the community coming together. It's got to be the administration. It's got to be the board. We all have to support that. But how can we support something if you're closing schools? You know, how you want me to pay more taxes and then you're closing my school down? You know, it's just not going to sell. I'm sorry, it's not. So instead of closing schools, let's think about it. Let's have a bond. Let's have a TRA in November. $7 million. The chart says that he can save $3 million by closing down three campuses. That's not enough. You can get $7 million by passing a TRE and a 13 cent tax increase. And I think the community will support it. So I ask you to do that for you. Any other board member? Good evening, I'm Mrs. Ostiki, and I am your board president. Um, let me give you some backstory. I've been on the board for two years. <coughs> this news of school closures has been circulating for a year, that is correct. And, um, and I believe because of that, we may have had a few parents late, a few. The reason why I say that because uh, my daughter was the number one product of this district in 2015. She was valedictorian. Okay? She's in her second year at a university, UTSA. She's in the biomedical engineering program. She didn't score high enough on her SAT to be accepted to A&M, which is a better bioengineering program. It's one of the best. So she got accepted at UTSA. She struggled. Number one product of this district that is struggling. Is it the teacher's fault? Is it the administration's fault? Is it the board's fault? It falls on the board. The board is responsible for the outcomes of the students of this district. The board is responsible for the monies that come to this district. You may know that we have a conservator. A conservator appointed by TEA, the body that regulates education here in Texas. I call her, and no offense, Dr. Castleberry, a babysitter for the board. What does that mean? Is that for the past several years, five to ten years, the board was not functioning the way they're supposed to. Which is a shame, because who suffers? The students suffer. We have a very good group of teachers, a very good group of administration. The administration is new. They have been here for two years. Those individuals up there in their positions, most of them two years, some a little bit less. It is the board's job to hold them accountable. The principals are under them. The teachers are under the principals. Where was our focus? Where was the board's focus? Not on the students. Because my number one, the number one product of this district is struggling. And that was in 2015. She went from first grade all the way to 12th grade here in the district. The teachers are struggling because there's not, we're implementing programs that are outdated. We need to come up to this 2017. There's better programs, but guess what? They're pretty pricey. Not only do you, are the programs pricey, but to train the teachers to implement the programs costs money. If we have no money, who suffers? The students. The students suffer. Now, this district graduates about 500 students, give or take a year. I want all 500 students to have a fighting chance when they reach adulthood. Would you agree? Yes. Whether it be in a college, 
a university or a, career, a certified industry. What I mean by that is a cosmetologist, a nursing, a welder. Now we may have some of those programs in place already at our, at our career technology. So, I mean, for the area of cosmetology, that is, they tread so fast on different things that our cosmetologies are not even up to date on that. They still have, those students, if they want the latest trends, they still have to go to school at the for-profit school and pay a pretty penny just to get the latest trends, which is not right because we should be able to support them and have a fighting chance once they become adults. Now, I guarantee, I can't guarantee, but as your board president, I'm holding these guys accountable. The state really allows us to hold the superintendent accountable. I can tell you that this board since January, we attended a Lone Star Governance um, seminar, and it's a model that we're implementing. If you've been attending our meeting, I've been, um, the, the reports that have been coming to us, the discussion of the board is based on student outcomes. And we are not meeting state standards. We had, I asked, we had no in, in required improvement to, uh, schools under his leadership. That had not happened before Dr. Saavedra got here. It's only been two years. He's only been here two years. That's pretty good. But every so often, every three to five years, the state changes the accountability system. We're in that year. And there's panic because we're we're not using that system yet, but they're using our scores to kind of give us a little range of where we kind of follow that system. Oh, we got this another. We're not good. Which is kind of good because it tells us we need to strive and be better. We're good right now, but I'm not satisfied with good. We need to be better. I have a third grader who is going to be greatly impacted by a choice, by three choices that we make. She attends Kindred. Where I live, we would go to um, Hazen Middle School. But in the section I live, 10 years ago, we went to Dwight. Now, I know my neighbors. I've been in that community for 14 years. And some of my neighbors love Dwight. Some of my neighbors are in love with Hazen. I went to Kaysen. I'm a product of South San. I graduated in 1992. I was number 11. Let's not talk about why I don't have a degree, because it was hard. I went to college, and I had to take remedial classes. And that, it was very discouraging. So I, rather, I got married and had kids, and then pushed my husband through school. But I don't want that for our kids. I want them to be able to be a success wherever they go. Now let me talk about the bilingual cluster, because it is a concern. Currently, the bilingual classes, and correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Saavedra, the bilingual classes, in a classroom, you have students that are classified as bilingual, and you have students classified that they only know one language, and it's primarily the English language. So it is a disservice right now if we have 17 students in that classroom and only five of them are your true bilingual. That means that they only know Spanish, let's say it's kindergarten, their primary language is Spanish, they're put in a bilingual class where 14 or 13 of their peers speak English. You don't think that's hard on the teacher? Hard on those students? Because the teacher's not speaking Spanish only. The model we're trying to implement now is as a kindergartner, it's 90% Spanish, 10% English. Am I correct? And true bilingual student only. Does that make sense? 
to teach the primary language of the student and build that second language every year. It is detrimental to students to teach them a language they don't know as soon as they come into kindergarten. It's supposed to be phased in. Phased in. And it's not being phased in right now. That's why it's working at Northside. We need it to work here. We need these students to have a fighting chance as they grow. Now, it's an implementation. If we see the numbers and we see that it's not working, then the board is tasked to say, Dr. Savedra, let's change that plan. It's not working. The student outcomes aren't where they need to be. But that's what the board is here for, is to get reports and make those necessary changes and tell the superintendent that program is not working. Let's change it. But we have to work together. Prior to the two years, well, no, even within those two years, this board did not collaboratively work with the superintendent and his staff. Hence, a babysitter. But I believe now, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Castleberry, there's been a change. We are working with the superintendent. And I was not tasked to approve everything that he suggested. The conversation we had is, how are we going to collaborate? How are we going to work together? And believe it or not, prior to years, we were not working together. <coughs> no. We were not. We were, we were at opposing ends, and guess who suffered? The students suffered. Now we're collaborating. I can honestly say all seven members on the board are focused on students now. Now, I understand if you as a community don't trust the board. I understand if you as a community do not trust the administration. We don't trust when they say one thing and then turn around and say something else. That is correct. Because that is what has been happening the last 10 years. As a board member and as the president, I want to be accessible to you as the community. I am approachable. I have kids in the community. I don't have kids in all of the schools. You as parents need to have an ongoing conversation with your board members. That's how it works, is to have an ongoing conversation with your board members. If your campus is struggling, you need to go to your principal. If your principal is struggling, you need to tell her, speak with your administration. If administration is not happening, then you come to the board. But as board members, all we, are hold, all we can hold accountable is the superintendent. So one of the things I've been hearing in these last three meetings is the superintendent's salary. Now, two things on that. How many of you have gotten hired for a specific amount that you were presented with and, you, and you, you're in agreement with it, so you accept the job? Now, how would you feel down the road, they say, you know what, you make too much, let me decrease your pay. Okay. That, I wouldn't want to work there. Okay. I wouldn't want to work there. So we lost a lot of employees that way. Yes. Now, the superintendent is hired by the board. The superintendent was hired by the board. The board is the entity that hires the superintendent. I was in here when that took place. When I came on the board, Dr. Sofeather was already here. But guess what? I'm a team player. I may not have been a team player in the beginning, but as a board president, I have to set those differences aside because the kids suffered those two years, and now we need to see growth. And this low star motto that is being presented by TEA brings that focus back. And we are working as a board 
to bring the folks back to students. Now, what I say to you as parents is, give us a chance. Give us a chance. Yes, sir.
but the public document, the, the corrective action plan, put the responsibility in the previous board. And whether we agree with it or not, that, that is the fact. Yeah. Uh, other than you want to continue? Yeah, I'm done. Okay. Now, now, I will stay, I think you will stay, and I know support members will stay. If there's other questions that you'll have, we'll be happy to respond to them. We'll be up here. And you can close the meeting. Did y'all comply with that? Yeah, the time is 748. The meeting is now closed. But like counters of other staff, we will be here to, to answer. You can talk to us. Yes.